with Andy Savitz, author of Talent Transformation and the Triple Bottom Line, Gretchen Digby from Ingersoll Rand, and Bruna Sarda from Jell. We've been talking about how to build an engaged culture of sustainability within a company. Andy, in your book, you talk about the role that HR should play in building an engaged culture of sustainability. In NAM's research, however, we found that HR very often doesn't have a seat at the table when it comes to these cross-functional collaboration around sustainability. Can you tell me why they should? Yes, well, there's been a lot of attention paid in the sustainability movement to engagement, but not so much to internal engagement with employees. And that is proving to be an incredibly important factor in differentiating between winners and losers. CEOs and HR professionals are very anxious to make sure that their employees are engaged, not in participating, but are actually committed, motivated, and loyal to the company. That's what get, gets measured every year in these employee surveys. Um, it turns out that there's a pretty strong connection between having a sustainability uh, initiative and focusing on environmental and social issues and the degree of motivation that employees feel uh, toward the company. And engaged employees, there's sort of small e participation and big e uh, engagement, which is commitment and loyalty to the company. And the more motivated employees feel about their jobs, the more customer satisfaction there is, the more productivity there is, the less absenteeism there is. And especially with millennials coming into the workforce, uh, the triple bottom line, you know, people, planet, and profits, is turning out to be a major motivator in terms of that big E engagement. And uh, that's why I think HR you know, needs to be involved. They measure engagement and they know what moves employees in the company. You know, Part of their job is making sure that people in companies, that employees have fulfilling jobs uh, and are motivated in those jobs. So that's you know, a major sort of overlooked lever uh, for people uh, like Bruno and Gretchen who are trying to move their companies in the direction of sustainability. Mm. Gretchen, you in your former role were director of safety. So you helped create safety, behavior-based safety programs. Today you manage and lead um, engagement efforts on behalf of Ingersoll Rand's sustainability programs. How are those two cultures similar and how are they different? Okay, so in behavior-based safety, you know, you are basically embracing the personal values of the individuals, bringing it into the workplace. Everyone values safety, safety is first, and it becomes a part of everyone's job. Everyone understands it, and it is first. I'm trying to do the exact same thing with sustainability. They're, you know, in more so today than 20 years ago, everyone's passionate about the environment and sustainability in their communities, and so we are trying to enable, I guess, the platform so that the workplace is accepting of that value. They can bring it in and do the similar habits and behaviors and things they're used to doing at their home in their community, we're creating ways for them to do that in the workplace, regardless of what their job is. So it's no longer just the environmental manager's job to care about recycling, it's everyone's job because everyone can take a part. So we created a couple of programs around that. Um, it's definitely not one size fits all. We have our very structured green teams program where you can, as you said, be the little E and actually participate beyond those teams. But what that does to your point is the ripple effect of everyone seeing that happen as a volunteer activity that my company is supporting. It, it's a ripple effect and the engagement is there. We have another program to sort of capture the other folks who don't want to be in that structured team environment called One Step Forward. And that's very closely models behavior-based safety and how I can individually make a difference and bring that value in and apply it into my job regardless of what that is. We sort of equip them with sustainability um, knowledge and tools that give them a new lens of a new way to look at their jobs and how they perform and how they affect the overall sustainability performance of the company. And there's a factoid which really plays into this that 95 percent of uh, people in the United States uh, who live in homes are involved in conserving in their home, shutting off the lights, using less water, but less than 45% are involved at the workplace. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the programs that are designed to bring sort of personal values and personal behavior into the workplace are bound to be successful. One just has to find ways to allow those, uh, those values to come forward in the workplace and give employees platforms like behavioral yep. safety to uh, 
to be involved in, in those things. And, and, and I think the biggest component of that, I'll just add, is the recognition for those actions. And really, I mean, making heroes out of people who turn off the light when they leave the room. Um, it's not, I know it's not my electricity bill at my home, it's my company's bill, but I'm going to take part in helping save or conserve that energy or wh whatever the end result of the measured data is that comes from that. But it's really recognizing those individual actions and behaviors along the way that help the company move forward. And Bruno, I'd like to bring you into the conversation. Last week, Dell announced its 2020 goals, which was a big step forward for the company in terms of kind of going beyond some of the base level operational goals that had previously achieved. Can you talk to me a little bit about the role that the corporate culture around sustainability that Dell has created helped inform those goals? Sure. Um, so, you know, we, we've been at this for a while and the last big kind of uh, goal and ambition we had set out about, uh, you know, six, seven years ago was actually to be the greenest IT company in the world. Uh, because at the time, that was the recognition that that's who we were. It was about making our 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 footprint, you know, uh, uh, as as small and efficient as it could be. Um, our our culture has evolved as our company has evolved in the last few years. We are now a much more complex, uh, much more complete company, really uh, primarily focused on solutions and solving problems through technology and this new plan we have uh, called the legacy of good is actually really about that it's about how do we bring more value into the world than we take to generate our you know and maintain our existence and so the the, the culture we've created along the way of of accountability of measurement of engagement uh, because we've been very fortunate to have a very broad section of the company uh, uh, involved and aware because um, again at the end of the day you know a relatively small percentage of our hundred thousand plus employees are actually doing something to deliver against the plan but most are aware and and supportive and they're like the you know the hordes of supporters in the stadiums who are cheering the team on because they they want to see it succeed and that um that was a very strong motivator um even at a time you know when when organizational dynamics, organizational changes are happening where this was like, no, you know, we're, we're not deviating from this. This is, this is a big part of who we are. This is something we want to do and we're going to put this out there. So there was a lot of momentum already created to sort of support the creation of some ambitious new yes. objectives. And, but it seems like the goal setting process itself is sort of an exercise in engagement. Can you explain how that works and what goes into setting ambitious goals like that? Sure. Well, you know, when, when you're a relatively large and complex organization, um, you know, you can have the most talented and passionate sustainability professionals. They're just not going to be the experts in all aspects of the operation that need to be uh, ultimately uh, part of of what we deliver against within our goals. So uh, we learned early on that, you know, our functional experts are absolutely critical, not only to delivering against the goals, but in helping set the goals. So, you know, whether it's the facilities managers, you know, you don't go tell a facilities manager how to go save water or conserve energy. You ask them, you say, you know, how far can we go and what would it take? And in your expertise, they'll always know better than we will. Uh, and this is true in logistics, this is true in product design, this is true in supply chain management, it's true in, in customer facing uh, but This roles. brings us back to HR because right. uh, setting these kind of ambitious, innovative goals as Dell has is really about making change happen. Mm -hmm. And change management, you know, goals are a big part of it, but it's not the only part of it. And HR uh, knows about change management, how to change organizations. It's about organizational capacity. It's about organizational design. And ultimately, it's about embedding these values into the employee life cycle, you know, from your employee employer brand to who you hire, how you train and develop your right. people, who yeah. gets promoted, uh, you know, all of this. You can have a sustainable culture, but unless it's got the infrastructure, the uh, sort of what I call the HR infrastructure, that you know, sort of continues to promote that culture, you know, it will eventually wither and die on the vine. Yeah. Gretchen, tell us a little bit about how your green teams are structured. In your talk today, you, you mentioned um, that you're allowed to get off the green team, but only if you nominate a replacement. How does that sort of governance model sort of perpetuate the culture or maintain it so that it doesn't wither on the vine, as you say? Well, yeah, I mean, we all experience burnout. 
at times, right? And something that we're working on. And, and we do experience, um, or, or we found, you know, through some of our more mature green teams that they, the more they rotate through their membership, the more active and engaged they are because they're all coming to the table with fresh ideas. Now, we, now the, the epitome of recycling, right? We'll get some old members come on back after they've been around for a few years. They'll take <laughs> a break and they'll come back with brand new ideas. And maybe it's something they learned from their child or their grandchild or something that's new coming out of the schools, you know, that are already um, learning so much more than, than we did or I did, excuse me, in that time. But um, yeah, so it's it's one of our it's part of our framework um, that you know it, it is volunteer in nature. So it, it is it's been a challenge to at the corporate level in our sustainability department to sort of um, gather all the data, measure the progress, and not be a required program, right? So we still want to keep that volunteer nature, and that's just one way we do that. That you know you're you're not required to stay on the team, um, but when you rotate off. The in, you are strongly encouraged to nominate a replacement. And what that does, it's really that ripple effect. You get the bystanders involved that you know, maybe originally didn't want to, but being able to talk to them and say, hey, here's, here's what this green team has done for me. And it's usually pretty easy to get the pull to get more people in because of the recognition piece that I was talking about before and just making heroes yes. out of the folks Ingersoll, that are making the difference. Ingersoll Rand is one of the companies that I came across in doing research for my book mm -hmm. that is actually trying to measure the uh, the impact of little e participation on big e engagement and this rotation idea you know chances are the people who rotate off those green teams may be burned out but they probably feel a little bit better about ingersoll rand mm -hmm. uh, which stays around in terms of this big e motivation loyalty and commitment mm -hmm. um, you know and it's also true as uh, ingersoll rand is showing that not everybody has to participate in everything mm -hmm. but that simply knowing that the company stands for these ideals and is working uh, as Dell is, for example, on ambitious sustainability goals tends to motivate everybody in the company, whether they're directly involved in those efforts or not. I call them bystander employees, uh, but, this, uh, but the participants can have a positive a motivating effect on bystander employees. And, and Ingersoll Rand is, is looking at this and has found, I believe, Gretchen, that in places where there are green teams, the non-green team members are more highly motivated, have more of that big E engagement uh, that HR measures. Well, you know, I, uh, I, I get to, um, in addition to my work at Dell, I actually get to partner closely with Arizona State University's School of Sustainability that has really spent a lot of time trying to develop the, uh, some, some science and research mm -hmm. around how do you make sustainability happen and one of the things um, that has been that has been found is exactly what you're saying is in fact many people want to work in sustainability yet most of them will not have sustainability in their job title because similar to quality similar to ethics similar to uh, a lot of these things you know you can bring so much power to whatever position you have in the finance department in the operations department in the HR department and so it's created this this leadership mentality this culture of change from you know uh, uh, whatever part of the organization you're in rather than saying the only way to go affect change is to be the next chief sustainability officer and uh, and it's been a powerful model even in you know I often get approached both at Dell and outside in terms of how do I get into this field and the first question I ask is what do you do now yeah. and and I always find uh, one or two things that I say you know you could probably do right now within your sphere of influence uh, that would actually have a very positive impact on your organization. And to your point, I think uh, through performance management, through learning and development, through all of that, HR has a, has a strong role uh, to play as a catalyst and, a, and, a, and an activator for those things. Well, they're by definition cross-functional. Yeah. I mean, they're the one organization within the organization that's mm -hmm. looking at everybody across the board in terms of culture, in terms of organizational design in terms of making sure that uh, companies have a prepared workforce for future environmental and social challenges, for example. Um, so there's a lot of power there. There's a lot of leverage for uh, the kind of things that both of your companies are trying to do, but unfortunately it's a lever that has more or less been unused for a lot of you know, historical and other reasons. But I think now with, uh, you know, people used to laugh when you'd say sustainability is everybody's job, but increasingly uh, you know, what you say, Bruno, is right, that uh, you can be the CFO or you can be uh, the comptroller or you can be the purchasing agent. You know, there is a, a triple bottom line aspect to everything people do. And, uh, you know, 
uh, these cross-functional departments like HR are in a perfect position to make sure that this becomes a unifying right. uh, right. force within the company. I, I, li I like your, your statement earlier of, you know, every citizen takes personal responsibility for disposing of their waste properly or conserving energy a certain way. And I think every employee, not only as a as human behavior, like don't throw mm -hmm. your trash on the ground at work because you don't at home, but also looking at your function. Every function has a role yes. to play yes. in an organization. Mm -hmm. Right, and many functions have gotten on this train, uh, but a few uh, <laughs> are still sort of watching the rear end of the train go by, and, and HR happens to be one of them. But, you know, uh, that's one reason I wrote the book, was to try and help people understand what this sort of sweet spot between uh, sustainability and HR might be, and how it can be to not only the advantage of both sustainability and HR, because there are things sustainability people can do to advance core HR missions like hiring and recruiting the top talent that is more and more interested in these things. Um, but it's also uh, part of how you uh, increase competitiveness and, and enhance the business goals. You know, uh, So working together with business strategy, HR and sustainability can really help propel, uh, as you say, you know, winning with integrity. Mm -hmm. or performance with purpose. Uh, these are the things that uh, companies want to do now because it's the things that people are attracted to, as Gretchen said, and it's the thing we need to do, which is to figure out how to harness the power of these great institutions, mm -hmm. these capitalist businesses that we've created to help uh, address the world's big challenges. Well, thanks so much all for being here and for sharing your thoughts and, and your experiences.